so namaste everyone. Pranam Maharaj, um, it is a profound privilege to welcome you all to this special symposium on Hindu monk and teacher Swami Vivekananda at the Free Library of Philadelphia. We are joined today by the revered Swami Tyagananda Ji, Dr. Jeffrey Long, and Dr. Devain Patel. Just a note that we will have a very brief Q&A towards the end. So if you have any questions, please just type them into the chat and I'll return to them after our speakers have finished giving their talks. Our first speaker will be Swami Tyagananda Ji. Swami, I'm just going to read everyone's bios one by one as they speak. <clears throat> Swami Tyagananda Ji is a senior monk of the Ramakrishna order. He joined the order at the monastery in Mumbai in 1976 after graduating from the University of Mumbai in India. He received spiritual instruction, Mantra Diksha, from Holy Mother Sharda Devi's direct disciple, Swami, Vireshwaran Swami Vireshwarananda Ji, and his monastic vows, Sanyasa, from Swami Gambirananda Ji. Besides Mumbai, Maharaj has served in monasteries at Belur Mat, New Delhi, and Chennai, and was sent to Boston in 1998 to assist Swami Sarvagatananda Ji. He has been the Hindu chaplain at Harvard and MIT since 1999, and after Swami Sarvagatananda Ji re retirement in 2002, he was appointed head of the Vedanta Society of Boston. Uh, Maharaj's discourse is entitled Swami Vivekananda on Strength. Okay. Namaste, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you, Divya. And I want to commend the Free Library of Philadelphia and other devotees and friends of Vivekananda for marking this 130 years since his uh, arrival in the United States, his first visit here. And I thought I would share with you this morning a few thoughts on. Vivekananda and the idea of strength. It's difficult to be, he has spoken on so many subjects and to, to I thought it would be good to zero in on <clears throat> one aspect of his teaching, which uh, I feel is, in my opinion, one of the most important ones. And from our own experience in life, we see that how vital, how important the idea of strength or courage is. Um, we know that, of course, from the, uh, the theory of evolution, the survival of the fittest, that only those species which were able to face the challenges, <clears throat> they were able to survive and remain. And for all of that, you needed a lot of, to manifest the inner strength. Even today, we find that people who don't have courage or strength are the ones who tend to suffer more than those who do. Now, strength or courage is often thought of as a virtue. In other words, a kind of an ethical concept. Um, Vivekananda looked upon strength as an ontological concept, considering it as um, an essential attribute of reality itself. And so looking upon strength as an ontological concept rather than an ethical virtue, I think that opens up many new possibilities. And so I want to say something about strength because of that reason, because according to Swami Vivekananda, without strength or without courage, even the practice of any other virtues would be virtually impossible. And therefore he considered strength or courage to be the central teaching in the Gita as well as the Upanishads. To understand the role of strength, I think it will be helpful to look upon uh, the two basic forces in life, the two basic processes in life, which give life its dynamism, its vitality. And one of the forces is really just the reality of impermanence, that everything that we see around us is perishable, and philosophically, they just use the word non-being, things that tend to stop existing, things that tend to perish. And the second process at work in life is the, the, the struggle for existence. So on one side is this impermanence. On the other side 
is the struggle for existence. So being, a struggle to be as contrasted with the, the, the reality of impermanence. Now, in the modern societies in which we live, the struggle for physical existence is pretty much been eliminated, although in times again, which we live terrorism and, and, and gun violence, etc., we can no longer say that the physical threat is entirely gone. But it definitely seems to be less than ancient times when we read about the, the, the Jurassic Age. We don't have uh, T-Rexes and dinosaurs kind of wandering about so that we have to just protect ourselves. So relatively, physical threat has become less in the times in which we live, but psychological threat, the threat to the, to the ego is still very strong. And when the ego is threatened by non-being, its immediate reaction to that is anxiety. So the anxiety that we experience is the response of the ego to the reality of impermanence. Now, anxiety itself can take uh, two different forms. One is what we can call the pathological anxiety. And oftentimes that anxiety is related to some, uh, some terrible events that might have happened in our own past. And uh, we may not be able to deal with it in a constructive way. And so it's almost like surrendering to the non-being, not being able to deal with these trauma, traumas of the past. Now, that pathological anxiety clearly uh, belongs to a field of abnormal psychology, and then we will need um, a psychiatric treatment. And that's an extreme form of anxiety. But most of us have what can be called the existential anxiety in a sense that just by the fact that we are encased in this human body and mind, anxiety in one form or other seems to be inbuilt into our human existence. So existential anxiety is a common form of human experience. And now this existential anxiety can be, we don't need a psychiatric treatment, we don't need any medical intervention, it can be dealt with by our own selves. Now, what they have found is that, well, any kind of, there are many kinds of anxieties, of course, and while any of these kinds can appear in any time in our lives, oftentimes they have found that certain kinds of anxieties are associated with certain stages in life. So usually the youth, the early youth especially, is associated with the anxiety of guilt and condemnation. The, the midlife, and that's when we speak about the midlife crisis and stuff like that. So in midlife, most people seem to have the anxiety related to meaninglessness or emptiness. And then as we grow older, as we nearer, to seems to be the end of human existence, then the anxiety related to fate and death becomes more prominent. Now, it's not necessary that everyone needs to experience these, but this is what is generally seen on average, the kind of anxieties that people do experience. Now, what Vivekananda, when he tried to look at these reality of human existence and the different anxieties, it's possible to see them from a Vedantic perspective. So what, is, what does exactly the anxiety of guilt and condemnation mean? And a, a Vedanta student might say that that anxiety represents the negation of the essential purity of the self. So one of the teachings that Vivekananda returns to often is about our true nature. That who are we really? When we, when we look at ourselves, that this is me, of course, I'm pointing at my body. 
uh, am I just this body, just this bones and flesh and blood? Is there anything more in my me than the body? And clearly we know that there is something more deeper, more subtle within us. Man, we could just call it all of the things. It's a big package, really. The mind, the intellect, the ego, our hopes, emotions, feelings. Now, all of these things are part of my personality, but none of these things can be found when a surgeon cuts my body open. And so that's a subtle part of my being. Now, is that who I am? And what the Gita, the Upanishads, the philosophy that Vivekananda taught so forcefully and so effectively was that beyond the body, beyond the mind, is a deeper reality. And that is the self. That is the real me there. So while the body and the mind are material, the body, uh, uh, a product of gross matter, we today even know the chemical composition of the body. We know that the body ultimately would return to dust, just a heap of ashes when the body is cremated. But the mind as well is a product of matter, a very subtle matter, sukshma. And because both the body and mind are material, that is why they are able to act and react upon one another. And that's why we know that um, if the body is not doing well, eventually it tends to affect the mind. If the mind is not doing well, it eventually tends to affect the body. They say that 70% or more of the illnesses are psychosomatic in nature. So the the body and the mind are not as different as it might seem when we look at it from that perspective. But beyond both, the body and the mind is the self, which is birthless and deathless, pure and perfect. So the anxiety related to guilt and condemnation is a negation of that, that, that innate purity, essential purity of the self. That purity, and that's why uh, you could think about it in terms of it's a negation of the ananda. Sometimes we do think that when we are young, that's the happiest period of our lives. But, but research has showed that people who are teenagers and their late teens and early 20s are really not as happy as, as they would like to think they are. I mean, yes, it could be a lot of partying and all that, but Deep inside, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of uncertainty related to the future, clearly. What kind of, where will, where, uh, what kind of a career I'm going to choose? Who is going to be my life partner? And so this uncertainty is when you're neither too, not the, the, the innocence and carefree phase of our life when we are little children, that's over. We haven't yet become full adults yet. That kind of an interim period, there's a lot of anxiety. And, and, um, and so it's seen as the negation of the ananda. When you speak about satchit ananda, the anxiety of guilt and condemnation is seen as the negation of that ananda aspect, which is our true nature. And then as we grow older, um, the, the midlife crisis, as it is sometimes spoken of, that is when People have uh, entered the workforce, uh, found some meaning, found some joy, the family, children, and so on. Then a phase is reached in many cases, again, not in every case, but in many cases, when suddenly there is a pause. We begin to wonder like, what's the point of all this? Does it even make sense? We begin to question some of the assumptions of our early life. And that's when the anxiety related to meaninglessness, anxiety related to emptiness comes up and, and, and takes hold of us. And that is the, can be seen as the negation of the essential perfection of our true nature or the negation of the, the chit aspect, sat chit ananda. And finally, as we, as we grow older still in, a, in, a, in an advanced age, the anxiety related to fate and death becomes real. When death no longer feels as if it's a very distant possibility. And that's, of course, the negation of, of the very existence of the self. 
And so it's seen as the negation of Sat. So all of these different or the major kinds of anxieties that we experience can be seen as somehow us negating the essential nature, Sat Chit Ananda. Now, the only way we can deal with anxiety, which weakens us, which definitely is extremely weakening, is through strength. Now, there are at least three different ways of manifesting our strength. Three different sources from which that strength can come. The first strength or the first source, I would say, is, is moral, moral strength or moral courage. A courage to live according to dharma. Now, strength, we know. I mean, uh, rescuing someone in a in fire, that strength, of course, the, the strength that is shown by um, soldiers, etc., on a battlefield to protect their motherland. Again, that strength. But those are specific responses in specific situations. But the other kind of strength is sometimes often not recognized. The strength of a person with limited means trying to live, facing the daily challenges of life, trying to take care of their family, their children, in spite of many constraints. Or the, or the, or the, the strength of a person who is trying to live ethically, living according to dharma, even when people around probably don't hold on to such ethical standards. People around are telling lies or being selfish. Even in that environment, someone who strives to live truthfully, honestly, without getting corrupted by the environment. I think that's strength. Now, that kind of strength is not often recognized. So moral strength, people don't even have to believe in religion, don't have to believe in God. If someone is an atheist, that doesn't necessarily mean the person is an immor immoral. So holding on to dharma, holding on to moral code gives an enormous amount of strength. So that's one strength. I would call it a moral courage, a moral strength. The second source of strength is the strength that comes through belief in God. That strength that comes through surrendering oneself to this higher divine power. A religious strength, if you like, a religious courage. The, the courage of a bhakta or a devotee. So if the first moral courage is when the ego takes shelter or refuge in dharma, a religious courage would be when the ego takes shelter in a, in a higher deity, a higher power, a divine being. So that's the second. And we know people with this deep shraddha, deep faith in God, have manifested enormous strength, are able to deal with the challenges in life in a very constructive way. And a third source of strength is, uh, for lack of a better term, I would just say spiritual strength. That is taking shelter in one's own true nature as the spirit, as the Atman. And none of these three sources are mutually exclusive. It's possible to have one or more or all of these. If we can tap the strength, either through dharma or through faith in God or through one's own deep spirit or, or in all of them at the same time, um, it's possible to deal with these anxieties in our life by ourselves without depending on anyone. So one of the ways that we can do this, for instance, the, the, the anxiety of guilt and condemnation, a bhakta or a devotee can say that God loves me and he has forgiven me. I don't need to feel guilty. I don't need to feel judged by anyone because I have God's forgiveness. Or someone from, from a philosophical standpoint, someone can say I'm pure and blissful and so sin cannot touch me. So affirming this can help take, get rid of the, the anxiety related to guilt and condemnation. Similarly, anxiety related to meaninglessness or emptiness. A devotee can say, God fills my heart with his love and I don't feel empty anymore. Or from the path of Jnana Yoga, someone could say, I'm full of consciousness and every experience is meaningful to me. 
So the more we are able to make these affirmations, it's possible to deal with those anxieties. And the, the, the anxiety of fate and death, a bhakta or a devotee can say, God is eternal and being in God's presence, I live through eternity. Philosophically, one could also say, I'm immortal and death is only an event in my unbroken existence. So it's possible to affirm these things and, 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 and remove these uh, anxieties which are associated with our very existence as human beings. So all forms of non-being, these threats to the existence of the ego can be overcome simply by asserting, affirming the real nature of the Atman. In fact, Vedanta goes a step further and as Vivekananda stressed again and again, especially in his lectures on Jnana Yoga, is that Vedanta denies non-being itself. Non-being or Maya is not real. It's, it's an appearance. And as long as we are fooled by appearances, it appears as if it's real, but it can be negated by just holding on to the only one and true reality of the spirit. And so there is no need to fight with guilt and condemnation or emptiness or fear of death all through our lives. We can simply live completely free from all of these problems if we only realize our true nature as this luminous self, which is birthless and deathless, that we are more than simply our body and mind, that there is this deeper reality and that's who I truly am. Now, those who are not able to affirm any of these three kinds of strength, the three kinds of courage that I just mentioned, moral courage, religious courage or spiritual courage, sometimes they choose to surrender a part of themselves in order to gain strength from outside. And in their case, the ego takes refuge in, an, in a group, in an external group. Now that sometimes can be thought of as a kind of a collectivization of the ego. Um, so you see this kind of thing happening in in uh, movement, I mean, I mean, just in our own life, we see as an individual, we feel oh, I'm helpless. There's anyone can come and do anything to me. But once I feel I'm I'm a citizen of this big country, so I'm a part of this larger whole. I've kind of expanded myself with a national identity. Then I feel that if there's any threat, the nation will protect me. I, as a person, can't be can't defend myself. But being a part of a larger group, I can feel more secure. So we surrender a part of our selves, part of our individual freedom for a larger group uh, to feel more secure. Now, a national identity probably may not seem as, um, as uh, terrible, although nationalism has its own, own issues, but sometimes people become parts of movements, which is what happened, both historically and even contemporarily, uh, the movements of like communism or Nazism, fundamentalism. These are, these are larger groups in which people are, feel that somehow if they can become a part of that group, the group will protect them. So, so that's one way people try to find strength when they are not able to deal or not able to affirm this moral strength or religious strength or spiritual strength as individuals. Uh, so that's one, one of the phenomenon that we have seen. Now, the ego, which is not able to use any of these four methods, the three methods, which I mentioned before, or this kind of a surrendering, uh, they yield to non-being. They are not able to hold their, hold their own. And it's in such cases then people yield sometimes to depression, to alcohol, to sex, to neuroses of all kinds. Now, in extreme cases, this can even lead to suicide. So anxiety, it's so, so vital that we know how to deal with it. And Vivekananda's teachings give us the tools to deal with it, to, to, to manifest strength in our life, so that we can deal with all of our challenges. And 
And, and that's why I felt that when we think about Vivekananda, uh, in fact, um, one of our elderly Swamis used to say, uh, as, as we know, Vivekananda didn't live to see his 40th birthday, so he died very young. Um, it's very difficult to imagine Vivekananda as an old man, um, tottering and kind of physically weak. You just can't, it's, you can't visualize him that way because he didn't, really didn't live to become that old as well. But more through his teachings, we see that it's not the age of the body itself or, or, the, or, or the mind, but to affirm our own true nature. That is what will help us deal with the challenges of life, not only in our day-to-day -day life, but the ultimate challenge, recognizing or getting to know the kind of answers to questions we don't have yet. Where did I come from? Where will I go? What's the ultimate purpose of life? What does death even mean? What happens after death? And all of these things to find answers, to, to benefit from them and to become strong, we need to manifest that inherent strength in our heart. So these are some of the thoughts I thought I might share with you this morning about Vivekananda on strength. There is a lot to think about. And uh, I'm sure many of you have given thought on to this subject as well. So um, I would encourage you uh, that whenever you read Vivekananda, not only Vivekananda really, any of these great thinkers and philosophers and saints, um, it's helpful to see how they manifested the strength in their own lives. There was a lot to learn from them and make our own lives happy and peaceful and blessed. So thank you very much. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, Next, we will uh, have Dr. Jeffrey Long, uh, who will be speaking. His speech is entitled, A Universal Religion, The Ongoing Relevance of Swami Vivekananda's Philosophy of Religious Cosmopolitanism. <clears throat> Dr. Jeffrey Long is the Carl W. Zeigler Professor of Religion, Philosophy, and Asian Studies at Elizabethtown College. He specializes in the religions and philosophies of India. He's the author of several books and numerous articles, as well as the editor of the series, Explorations in, the, in Indic Traditions for Lexington Books. In 2020, he received Elizabethtown College's Rank Award for Excellence in Research. And in 2022, his book, Hinduism in America, A Convergence of Worlds, received the Rajinder and Jyoti Gandhi Book Award for Excellence in Theology, Philosophy, and Critical Reflection from the Dharma Academy of North America. He has spoken in numerous venues, both national and international, including Princeton University, Yale University, the University of Chicago, Jawaharlal Nehru University, I can't say that, um, and Delhi University, and also given three talks at the United Nations. Dr. Long's talk is entitled a Universal Religion, The Ongoing Relevance of Swami Vivekananda's Philosophy of Religious Cosmopolitanism. Thank you so much, Dr. Long, for joining us today. Namaste. Namaste, and thank you, Divya, for inviting me to this. Thank you, Maharaj, for those wonderful and encouraging words. And they're making me feel strength now to give my presentation. So thank you very, very much. Um, if I can share my screen, uh, I have a little... Uh, PowerPoint uh, today. So hopefully you're you're all seeing that uh, right now. Uh, so seeing the pictures um, and the title, uh, the very famous picture here of Swami Vivekananda at the Parliament of World's Religions uh, with many of the other speakers uh, at that historic event. So uh, yes, as Divya said, my talk is uh, Universal Religion, the Ongoing Relevance of Swami Vivekananda's Philosophy of I changed it from religious to spiritual cosmopolitanism because I think that Swamiji's vision extends beyond only religion. There are many worldviews, and as Maharaj just said, uh, you know, someone may not be religious, and yet uh, they are still on the path, right? They are still uh, embodying and expressing truth in some very important way. So uh, I really wanted to make it as encompassing uh, as possible. So. Uh, the uh, presentation I'm giving today 
is based primarily on a, a single lecture that Swami Vivekananda gave uh, called The Way to the Realization of a Universal Religion. Uh, he gave this at the Universalist Church in Pasadena, California on January 28, 1900. So this was during his second stay in America and uh, not too long before he returned to India. And of course, as we know, uh, he left his body in, in 1902 on the 4th of July. So uh, this uh, is uh, not one of the last uh, talks that he gave, but it is near uh, the end of his career. And uh, I, it, it's one of my favorite uh, essays by Swami Vivekananda. Uh, it really it explores in depth his idea of what it means for there to be many religions, many worldviews, many paths, and how all of this fits together. And I want to talk about its ongoing relevance, which I, I think is really quite urgent, uh, because you know there's been so much polarization, so much conflict uh, on the basis of differences of religious belief, religious practice, uh, among religions, between religious people and non-religious people. And this conflict ranges from uh, argumentation on an intellectual level, which is by itself not a bad thing. Argumentation is a way to learn and to get a deeper understanding if we do it in an open-minded way. Uh, but uh, very often it extends over into uh, the destruction of relationships. And then, of course, at the most extreme, we have violence, we have warfare, we have genocide. So I really believe that Swami Vivekananda's vision of universal religion is something that uh, speaks to this problem and that were this way of thinking to be adopted more widely, I think would have great benefit for humanity. And uh, really, uh, I think if we're going to survive as a human species, we need to adopt something like Swamiji's way of thinking. So this is what I want to delve into. Uh, in this particular lecture, he articulates his philosophy of spiritual cosmopolitanism. Uh, he does not himself use this term cosmopolitanism, uh, but uh, a recent uh, scholar, uh, current scholar who's been studying his work very deeply, uh, Swami Medananda, uh, has used this term and uh, it, it has a lot going for it, as you'll see. Uh, it's a good description of what Swami Vivekananda is advocating in terms of how we think of the diversity of religions and worldviews. So what is this spiritual cosmopolitanism? Well, if we look generically at the idea of cosmopolitanism, it's the idea that all human beings are part of a single community. And this is really nothing new. If we go back to the Maha Upanishad, uh, we see in the very famous verse, Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, the world is one family. We see this articulated in the sixth chapter of the Maha Upanishad. And it has become kind of a slogan for those of us who want to argue for uh, the idea that we are one family and uh, that human beings form a single community. And this, uh, in terms of spirituality and in terms of religion, it's the idea that religions and worldviews should not be a barrier to human community and that the world's varied religions and philosophies can be seen as part of a common vision. Now, a very important part of this is understanding that Swami Vivekananda does not mean that we have to uh, eliminate our differences or compress all of the wonderful variety in the world uh, into some generic singular thing. Uh, when Swami Vivekananda refers to a universal religion, this does not refer to a single religion to which all people must adhere. And in fact, we know from other writings and teachings of Swami Vivekananda that if we were to ask him, are you referring to one religion that everyone has to follow? He would have said, God forbid. Uh, when he was asked, uh, should people, uh, you're, you're teaching Vedanta, which is a Hindu philosophy. Uh, should everyone become Hindu? He would say, God forbid. He would say, uh, no one needs to convert to anything, but we all need to learn from one another and absorb wisdom and knowledge from one another. So universal religion in Swami Vivekananda's usage refers to the wider vision in which many religions and philosophies can be seen to participate. If, if we look at the world's religions and philosophies in a certain way, we see them not as conflicting, but as each contributing some piece to our larger understanding. So what about the differences amongst the world's religions? Swami Vivekananda was very aware 
of the many differences among the world religions. Sometimes the idea is misattributed to him that all religions are the same. Uh, he knew they weren't the same, right? He uh, attended the Parliament of World Religions and he could see uh, and hear the many, many differences among religions. He grew up in India where there's so many different traditions. He was very aware of these differences, but difference does not have to mean contradiction in every case. Uh, in his own words, he says, I believe that they, that is the world's religions uh, and worldviews, are not contradictory, they are supplementary. Each religion, as it were, takes up one part of the great universal truth and spends its whole force in embodying and typifying that part of the great truth. It is addition, not exclusion. That is the idea. System after system arises, embodying a great idea, and ideals must be added to ideals, and this is the march of humanity. Man, meaning humanity, uh, never progresses from error to truth but from truth to truth, from lesser truth to higher truth. But it is never from error to truth. The child may develop more than the father, but was the father inane? The child is the father plus something else. Several important ideas can be discerned in this very rich quotation from Swami Vivekananda, and I just want to unpack it a little bit. First of all, of course, difference need not entail contradiction. It can also entail complementarity, right? There are many pieces of the truth. Reality is vast, it's complex, it can be perceived in many different ways. There is that wonderful story of the elephant uh, in India, which uh, you know, a group of people who are blindfolded, uh, they're all trying to describe and, and uh, explain what they're feeling, and they're all feeling different things because they're each contacting a different part of the elephant. And that uh, is the way reality is also. Uh, we each experience our own facet of reality based on our understanding, our background, where our consciousness is at that point. The religions may differ in regard to many details, but the central ideal of each one does not conflict with the ideals upheld by the others. And Swami Vivekananda goes into this. He talks about how various traditions, Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, they all emphasize certain core ideas. And there's no inherent conflict or contradiction across these central ideas. The importance of love, for example, emphasized in Christianity and in the bhakti traditions of Hinduism, uh, that does not conflict with the idea of the impermanence of the material world taught in traditions like Buddhism, the fraternity of all human beings taught in Islam, or of all life forms taught in Jainism, uh, and so on. Uh, there's nothing inherently contradictory about these ideas, and in fact, we could say that uh, a worldview that encompasses all of them is more complete and more full, uh, that we lack something if we do not uh, draw from these many different traditions. No worldview is completely false. We progress from lower truth to higher truth. This is also important. Uh, Swami Vivekananda will often say, he'll point to non-religious worldviews, he'll point to atheism, and he'll say, for example, it's better to be an honest atheist than to uh, make religious claims without having any direct realization or experience. Right? We're moving from different levels of understanding to higher levels of understanding. Now, when we talk about lower and higher, that implies there is a standard by which truth is to be measured. Swami Vivekananda was not just a relativist. Uh, there were things that he taught were true and were the case. Uh, there will be disagreements sometimes about what the standard is among the followers of the world's religions and the various worldviews. Uh, one person will say it's the Bible. One person will say it's the Quran. One person will say it's the Vedas. One person will say, well, it's scientific observation, but our respective scriptures, or really better, we could say in the Sanskrit tradition, our pramanas, our foundations for knowledge, point beyond themselves to a truth that is beyond words and that must be experienced directly. So we don't have to agree on all the details. We can start with a different book or a different starting point, but the idea is that we progress and we 
test our knowledge uh, uh, with experience and we have experiences, we have realizations and move deeper toward truth. Uh, this is actually explored more deeply in another uh, presentation, another lecture by Swami Vivekananda uh, on Sri Ramakrishna and Hinduism. And uh, he talks about the concept of the Veda, which in Hindu traditions, the Veda is the standard of, of truth. But Swami Vivekananda says that at the highest level, Veda does not mean just the set of books that go by that name. Veda refers, he says, to the sum total of super sensuous knowledge. That is all of our knowledge that goes beyond the senses. That is Veda. And he says there's a set of texts called the Vedas, which from his perspective as a Hindu, that is the standard that he uses. But he says these truths have been observed and can be found in the books of many religions. And uh, science also is a type of Veda, a type of knowledge. So if there is truth in many tradi traditions and many paths, should our attitude toward others be one of tolerance? Right? Tolerance is something we hear a lot about. Um, it's certainly better than intolerance. But Swami Vivekananda is really not very happy with this term tolerance. Uh, he says our watchword that word then will be acceptance, not exclusion. And not only toleration, for so-called toleration is often blasphemy. And I do not believe in it. I believe in acceptance. Why should I tolerate? Toleration means that I think you're wrong and I'm just allowing you to live. Is it not a blasphemy to think that you and I are allowing others to live, right? Who are we to say, I tolerate you. I will let you live and follow your path and follow your religion. Uh, it's not the business of any of us to go about uh, imposing on others what we think uh, they ought to be believing, what we think they ought to be doing in terms of their life path, their spirituality. And so acceptance is really the goal here, uh, not mere toleration. Um, one way I like to uh, express this idea very often is, uh, especially when I'm speaking with college students, I said, if you went back to your dormitory and your roommate said to you, I tolerate you, would that be a compliment? Right? Would you feel happy? Would you want to go to sleep in that room <laughs> with someone who's merely tolerating you? No, we want to be loved. We want to be accepted. And so this is what Swami Vivekananda teaches. I don't know if he was aware of this, but in this particular lecture, he was echoing the words of George Washington 100 years earlier. Uh, if you go to the synagogue of Newport, Rhode Island, uh, it's the oldest synagogue in North America, and there's a large inscription, and, and it is uh, a letter uh, it is a carving of, of the words of a letter that George Washington wrote to the Jewish community in Rhode Island shortly after uh, the U.S. independence. And he said, in this new country, we will not merely tolerate, but we will accept all religions. And this was after the Constitution had been written, the First Amendment, and after he had become president. And he was assuring this community that even though the majority uh, in the U.S. was Christian, uh, still is to this day, uh, that this would be a country marked by not only tolerance, but acceptance. So Swami Vivekananda is affirming an idea here that uh, is a very, uh, very deeply embedded in American history. So what is his vision of a universal religion? If we were to think this way, if we were to be accepting, as he describes, what would we do? What would this look like? He describes this beautifully. Uh, the, the final passages of this lecture, I think, are just uh, some of the most uh, profound teachings that he shared in his lifetime. He says, I accept all religions that were in the past, and I worship with them all. I worship God with every one of them in whatever form they worship him. I shall go to the mosque of the Mohammedan, the Muslim. I shall enter the Christian's church and kneel before the crucifix. I shall enter the Buddhistic temple where I shall take refuge in the Buddha and his law, his dharma. I shall go into the forest and sit down in meditation with the Hindu who's trying to see the light which enlightens the heart of everyone. Not only shall I do all these, but I shall keep my heart open for all that may come in the future. Is God's book finished, or is it still a continuing revelation going on? It is a marvelous book, these spiritual revelations of the world. The Bible, the Vedas, the Quran, and all other sacred books are but so many pages, 
and an infinite number of pages yet to be unfolded. I would leave it open for all of them. We stand in the present, but open ourselves to the infinite future. We take in all that has been in the past, enjoy the light of the present, and open every window of the heart for all that will come in the future. Salutation to all the prophets of the past, to all the great ones of the present, and to all that are to come in the future. Swami Vivekananda's vision is truly vast. He speaks not simply of the scriptures that exist today. He says this is an ongoing book. It is still being written, and there are infinitely many more things still to be revealed. He says we not only honor the past and the present, but we open ourselves to the future. He says, I, I accept religions that don't even exist yet, worldviews and ways of thinking that don't even exist yet, that will create new insight. So Swami Vivekananda's universal religion is, is an open-ended system. It is not closed. Uh, it is something that is uh, awake and open to uh, whatever is to come. And this really is the vision that I believe we need to survive as human beings, uh, to thrive on this earth uh, with other life forms. And uh, in fact, I, I've recently been writing and thinking a bit about um, the time when we uh, eventually meet other life forms. Uh, th there are many other life forms on this earth that we still need to communicate with and contact and learn to live with. And eventually, uh, I believe we will come into contact with life forms from other worlds as well. Uh, the search is on for planets that are like Earth. And uh, we've already found countless worlds uh, that are uh, orbiting stars in our universe. And so uh, if we take Swami Vivekananda's attitude, we want to be open hearted toward whatever those beings might have to share with us. Right? So this, this divine book is infinite. Uh, it is ongoing. It is unfolding. And uh, potentially there's no end to it. And so our attitude should be one of cosmic openness. This is so different, unfortunately, from what we so often see around us, uh, where uh, many of us continue to be closed-minded, uh, many of us continue to reject others purely on the basis of their religion or their ethnicity, uh, their gender, their nationality. We have all of these little divisions uh, that we're uh, using to create barriers to a true cosmopolitanism. So this means we have a lot of work to do. And what did Swami Vivekananda say about this work? Well, he said very famously, arise, awake, and stop not till the goal is reached. And so that is our challenge, uh, to uh, work always for uh, a more open world, a more cosmopolitan world. And uh, we don't want to fall into judgmentalism either. Uh, I think we want to affirm also that we need to begin with ourselves, being cosmopolitan within ourselves. Where are our own prejudices? Where do we tend to instinctively recoil maybe from some person or people because of something that we uh, maybe disagree with or don't approve of? Uh, Swami Vivekananda told us to see God in everyone. And it can be difficult. <laughs> God is playing hide and seek with us sometimes, it seems. Uh, but uh, that's our, that is our work. That is the uh, duty that has been put before us. So that is what I wanted to share with all of you today. This, uh, there's so many wonderful messages that Swami Vivekananda gives us. We could give countless lectures on the different facets of it. This is the part that moves me particularly and uh, that really drew me uh, to the field of studying many religions and philosophies. Um, and I just want to express my gratitude that I, I live in a world and in a, in a time when I can do that. You know, you can see all these books behind me, and that's just a few of my books. Uh, there, there is so much uh, that this book of Revelation is is constantly unfolding, and the fact that uh, we live in a time where we we can explore, and be open, and learn from so many wonderful traditions and so many wise masters 
uh, it, it really is a time to celebrate. And uh, so it, as we each work to transform our own lives into that kind of celebration, let us hope that that will become contagious, <laughs> right? More contagious than COVID, right? We want uh, acceptance to spread around the world. And uh, the kind of uh, cosmopolitanism that Swami Vivekananda advocated. And the, we have the means to do it. Uh, even this technology by which we're all communicating right now, uh, something that, uh, I don't know, maybe Nikola Tesla was envisioning it back in Swami Vivekananda's time. Uh, but uh, so many of us, who would have thought just a few years ago that we could sit and have a conversation as if we're all in the same room together. And some of us are in India, some of us are in Canada, some of us are in California, some of us are in Boston. And here I am in, in, in tiny Elizabethtown, uh, and uh, yet we're all together. So I think Swami Vivekananda's vision is coming true, and we should not be discouraged when we hear the bad news. Uh, those are maybe, maybe the death throes of the older way of thinking uh, on its way out. Let us hope so. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Professor Long. Um, our next speaker is um, Devin, Dr. Devin Patel. And I'm just going back to the bios, excuse me. I was just sorry, I was thinking of the wireless. We live in a wireless world. Our final talk will be by Dr. Devin Patel. Dr. Long is a scholar. Sorry, Dr. Patel is a scholar of Sanskrit literature, ballet, epic, and drama, Sanskrit grammar and linguistics, Indian philosophy, and ancient and modern South Asian languages more generally. He is associate professor of South Asia studies at the University of Pennsylvania and received his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. His book, Text or Tradition, the Naisadiya Charita and Literary Community in South Asia focuses on the story of Nala and Damyanti as rendered by the 7th century Indian philosopher poet Sri Harsha. He's also co-author of, please bear with me, Andhra Sab Shabda Chintamani, a grammar of Telugu language in Sanskrit and Kaviraja Margam, the way of the king of poets. Dr. Patel's talk is entitled Five True Thoughts. Namaste, Dr. Patel. The greatest men in the world have passed away unknown. The Buddhas and the Christs that we know are but second-rate heroes in comparison with the greatest men of whom the world knows nothing. Hundreds of these unknown heroes have lived in every country working silently. Silently they live and silently they pass away. And in, their, and in time, their thoughts find expression in Buddhas or Christs. And it is these latter that have become known to us. The highest men do not seek to get any name or fame from their knowledge. They leave their ideas to the world. They put forth no claims for themselves and establish no schools or systems in their name. Their whole nature shrinks from such a thing. They are the pure satrikas who can never make any stir but only melt down in love. In the life of Gautama Buddha, we notice him constantly saying that he is the 25th Buddha. The 24 before him are unknown to history. Although the Buddha known to history must have built upon foundations laid by them. The highest men are calm, silent, and unknown. They are the men who really know the power of thought. They are sure that even if they go into a cave and close the door and simply think five true thoughts and then pass away, these five thoughts of theirs will live throughout eternity. Indeed, such thoughts of theirs will penetrate through the mountains, cross the oceans, and travel through the world. They will enter deep into human hearts and brains and raise up men and women who will give them practical expression in the workings of human life. 
The Buddhas and the Christs will go from place to place preaching these truths. These sattvika men are too near the Lord to be active and to fight, to be working, struggling, preaching, doing good, as they say here on earth to humanity. This comes from the opening of Henry Miller. We are working at the Free Library of New York. This is the preface of Henry Miller's Air Conditioned Nightmare, his great book, his travelogue through America. And this he takes from Swami Vivekananda. Um, he, in fact, said about Swami Vivekananda that he, uh, for him, was one of the great influences in his life. And uh, I, at first, intended this entire talk to be just consisting entirely of quotations, as famous said by uh, Walter Benjamin. But uh, I took this title, Five True Thoughts, partly to take all of us who weren't here for the past eight weeks. We were sort of reading various things from the uh, collection of uh, sermons and writings of Swami Vivekananda. And uh, the eight were, um, and I hope we'll be hearing from uh, the latest iteration of this great event, the Parliament of Religions, uh, why we disagree. We, this is Swamiji's first, Swami Vivekananda's first uh, reading that we did. We did the way to the realization of a universal religion, which Professor Long just gave us a a very you know marvelous expression uh interpretation we read christ the messenger another terrific essay or a sermon again that which was um delivered in los angeles in 1900 the introduction of the four yogas and this uh, swami tyagananda gave a very wonderful uh, exposition to begin this presentation raja and then we did the various yogas raja yoga Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga. And we did another essay called The Great Teachers. So this is just to give you a sense of how those eight weeks went. And I really like this idea of the five true thoughts because I tried to identify if I could find five true thoughts from all these eight weeks. So one of them that came out was about universalism. Uh, and this was, I think, really wonderful what Professor Long mentioned that it wasn't a kind of tepid version of an interfaith logic. It was really a deep meditation on oneness and manyness. Um, and there's some startling things that are said in about this topic by Swami Vivekananda. One being that sectarianism is not bad. It's actually healthy. It shows that religion is alive. And... Uh, now I go back to quotations, and you may not hear much from me until the very end now. <laughs> this is the great lesson of the messenger, and another which is the basis of all religions. Renunciation. Here is the ideal. When a man has no more self in him, no possession, nothing to call me or mine, has given himself up entirely, destroyed himself, as it were. And that man is God himself. For in him, self-will is gone, crushed out, annihilated. That is the ideal man. We cannot reach that state yet. Yet let us worship the ideal and slowly struggle to reach the ideal, though maybe with faltering steps. It may be tomorrow or it may be a thousand years hence. But that ideal has to be reached, for it is not only the end, but also the means. To be unselfish, perfectly selfless, is salvation itself. For the man within dies, and God alone remains. Each religious sect has claimed the exclusive right to live. And thus we find that though there is nothing that has brought to man more blessings than religion, yet at the same time, there is nothing that has brought more horror than religion. Nothing is made more peace and love than religion. Nothing has engendered fiercer hatred. 
than religion. Nothing has made the brotherhood of man more tangible than religion. Nothing has bred more bitter enmity between man and man than religion. Nothing has built more charitable institutions, more hospitals for men and even for animals than religion. Nothing has de deluged the world with more blood than religion. We know at the time, at the same time, that there has always been an undercurrent of thought. There have been always parties of men, philosophers, students of comparative religion, who have tried and are still trying to bring about harmony in the midst of all these jarring and discordant sects. The world's greatest, great spiritual giants have all been produced only by those religious sects which have been in possession of very rich mythology and ritual. All sects that have attempted to worship God without any form or ceremony have crushed without mercy everything that is beautiful and sublime in religion. Their religion is a fanaticism, at best a dry thing. The history of the world is a standing witness to this fact. Religions manifest themselves not only according to race and geographical position, but according to individual powers. To learn this central secret that the truth may be one and yet many at the same time, that we may have different visions of the same truth from different standpoints, is exactly what must be done. Then, instead of antagonism to anyone, we shall have infinite sympathy with all, knowing that as long as there are different natures born in this world, the same religious truth will require different adaptations we shall understand that we are bound to have forbearance with each other. Just as nature is unity in variety, an infinite variation in the phenomenal, that in, in and through all these variation of the phenomenal runs the infinite, the unchangeable, the absolute unity. So it is with every man. The microcosm is but a miniature representation of the macrocosm. In spite of all these variations, in and through them all runs this eternal harmony. And we have to recognize this. This idea, above all other ideas, I find to be the crying necessity of the day. So universalism was one of these true thoughts that uh, Swami Vivekananda found in his cave. Another one was path, pragmatism. Now, the technical aspects of this were already presented, raja, jnana, karma, bhakti. Um, what I want to propagate is a religion that will be equally acceptable to all minds. It must be equally philosophic, equally emotional, equally mystic, and equally conducive to action. The um, breakup of this idea of path, I think there's two important things that we, uh, two important thoughts and ideas that we discussed in these eight weeks. One of them was uh, moral perception, perception, the importance of seeing and not um, thinking necessarily about. And the second one was the importance of concentration, power of thought, crystallized, distilled by concentration, concentration, Raja Yoga. But true religion
through religion never changes. Religion is realization. Not talk, nor doctrine, nor theories, however beautiful they may be. It is being and becoming, not hearing or acknowledging. It is the whole soul's becoming changed into what it believes. That is religion. What right has a man to say he has a soul if he does not feel it, or that there is a God if he does not see him? If there is a God, we must see him. If there is a soul, we must perceive it. Otherwise, it's better not to believe. It is better to be an outspoken atheist than a hypocrite. The object is internal. The mind itself is the object. And it is necessary to study the mind itself. Mind studying mind. We know that there is the power of the mind called reflection. I am talking to you. At the same time, I am standing aside, as it were, a per second person, and knowing and hearing what I am talking. You work and think at the same time while a portion of your mind stands by and sees what you are thinking. The powers of the mind should be concentrated and turned back upon itself, and as the darkest places reveal their secrets before the penetrating rays of the sun, so will this concentrated mind penetrate its own innermost secrets. Thus will we come to the basis of belief, the real genuine religion. We will perceive for ourselves whether we have souls, whether life is of the five minutes or of eternity, whether there is a God in the universe or none. It will all be revealed to us. So the power of thought is something which um, I think stands out. And I think others have seen this, five true thoughts. Um, and you know, I conclude in this way, I think everybody who comes across uh, these writings and these um, transcribed speeches, one of the things that we all noticed as a group was how clear, articulate, powerful these words were. So it's an incredible craftsman of the language. Uh, that's an overlooked fact, perhaps, perhaps why it's so compelling to all of these uh, Americans that uh, you know, read about him. It was remarkable. Um, and not only Americans, right? Famous Tolstoy famously said of him, you know, since 6 a.m. in the morning, I have been thinking of Swami Vivekananda. It is, it is doubtful if in this age, man has ever risen above this selfless spiritual meditation. This is what he said about Vivekananda. Um, and, you know, his articulate nature, I think, is uh, evident in the fact that a little known fact is that when he was giving lectures or moving around, he went to Harvard and, in fact, was offered the chair in Eastern philosophy there, which he declined because of being a monk. <laughs> so there's something uh, else about it that I think is compelling for many. And I will end here with a long, another long quote, this one again by where I began with Henry Miller. And uh, I think this is a good way to end. And then perhaps we can open up and I'd let, we'd love to hear from everybody else. The story of the pilgrimage of this man who electrified the American people reads like a legend. At first, unrecognized, rejected, reduced to starvation and forced to beg in the streets. He was finally hailed as the greatest spiritual leader of our time. Offers of all kinds were showered upon him. The rich took him in and tried to make a monkey of him. In Detroit, after six weeks of it, he rebelled. All contracts were canceled, and from that time on, he went alone from town to town at the invitation of such or such a society. 
I had just been reading Romain Rollins' book on Vivekananda. I had put it down because I couldn't read anymore. My emotions were so powerful. The passage which roused me to such a state of exaltation was the one in which Rollin describes Vivekananda's triumphal return to India from America. No monarch ever received such a reception at the hands of his countrymen. It stands unique in the annals of history. And what had he done, Vivekananda, that merits such a welcome? He had made India known to America. He had spread the light. And in doing so, he had opened the eyes of his countrymen to their own weaknesses. All India greeted him with open arms. Millions of people prostrated themselves before him, saluting him as a saint and savior, which he was. It was the moment when India stood nearer to being unified than at any time in her long history. It was a triumph of love, of gratitude, of devotion. I am coming back to him later, to his clean, powerful words, spoken like a fearless champion, not of India, but of the human race. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Namaste. Um, so uh, at this time, please uh, type in your questions in the chat. If you have any questions for Swamiji, Dr. Long, and Dr. Patel, please type them into the chat and I'll read them. Uh, we do have one question, which I'll ask first. Um, it is from Swagatadi, all the way from India. Thank you for joining. A question for Maharaj. Could you ask on my behalf, please? Pranam Maharaj, the possibility of using bhakti or gyan to deal with anxiety does not come naturally. How do we make it our basic nature, habit? Often anger or grief takes over first. Yeah, but this is, this is always a challenge. And as Krishna mentions in the Gita, that um, abhyasa and vairagya, that the more we can practice, and that practice becomes easier and possible, only if we are able to have some amount of detachment in our life. And the detachment is sometimes mistakenly thought of as cutting ourselves from other people and stuff like that. But that's not really what detachment is. Detachment really means two things. Internally, it's detaching ourselves from our egocentric life. And externally, it is detaching ourselves from things that are not vital to our own goal in life. So much of our time and energy is spent in just um, things that are superfluous. So the more we can detach ourselves from superfluous things, will have more time and energy for something that is deeper, something that is more meaningful, something that is more helpful. So I think practice is the only way we can, we can do what needs to be done in life. Next question, sorry is from Patricia G. Patricia G asks, is it better to study the mystical side of other religions rather than their dogma to come to a better understanding? I suppose, um, Maharaj, if you would like to answer it, or I, I suppose- it, No, maybe Jeff, give it a go. Okay, Maharaj, uh, as always, your wish is my command. So, um, there are, I think, two ways of looking at this. So, uh, yes, on the one hand, there is the idea that when we get into the mystical dimension, the experiential dimension, when we sort of get beyond words and dogmas, there is uh, this very profound experience, which we find at the heart of so many different religions. And Aldous Huxley wrote beautifully about this uh, in his perennial philosophy. So I think there's great value in thinking that way. And Swami Vivekananda also points toward that. He talks about the inner spirit of the religions. At the same time, uh, I think there is value, and Swami Vivekananda talks about this as well, uh, in looking at that 
dogmatic level, the level of teaching, uh, not as the final word, but because that is what guides many, many practitioners, most followers of a tradition, uh, that is their roadmap. And it is the product of those deeper intuitions, the, that, that mystical side that you mentioned, uh, insights come pouring out from that, but then they are coalesced into words and concepts. And those words and concepts are themselves not adequate to really convey the totality of the experience, but they're a guide, right? They're a roadmap, they're a signpost. And they've been placed there because for for people who are of that particular psychological makeup, that is the best way for them to begin on the path. And so uh, this idea of, of uh, many true religions or many true paths, it's very closely tied up with the idea of the yogas, which David G mentioned also, that uh, uh, each yoga has manifested in the form of specific religions. And Swami Vivekananda talks about this as well uh, in, in many of his writings. So uh, there's insight to be gained about the nature of reality, uh, even on the level of those teachings. And uh, Pravajika Vajaprana, uh, who's a wonderful author in our uh, Vedanta tradition, talks about how you could see the religions as pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Right? They're, each piece is different from the others. They're not the same. But if we have this more holistic vision that comes more from the mystical side, I think, we can see how these various ideas, seemingly contrary ideas, might actually fit together to form a, a more complete picture. So there's this dynamic on the spiritual path where you know eventually you get realization and you see it for yourself, and there's no more need for uh, these uh, kinds of teachings and dogmas. Uh, but for most of us, uh, we're not yet at that point, and so uh, we need these guideposts. And the uh, the the teachings on the formal level uh, work very well in that regard. Uh, but uh, the thing to always remember is that when they appear to conflict with one another, uh, to not allow that to turn into a source of bitterness or division among human beings. And uh, I've been told by several spiritual teachers, uh, including uh, Swami Thyagarana Maharaj himself, uh, that uh, when people debate and argue about these things, that that's usually occurring at a somewhat earlier level of the spiritual path. That when you see the, uh, the behavior of those who have really achieved this deeper realization, whether whatever tradition they are connected with or identified with, they embrace one another, right? They they um, uh, see that they are ultimately about the same things. And, and it's the less mature followers who sort of get hung up on the differences uh, to such an extent that it allows them to, to become combative with each other. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll finish with a wonderful quote from Swami Prabhavananda, who once said, that if we gathered the followers of the world's religions together, uh, they might kill each other. But if we gathered the founders of those religions together, uh, they would embrace. So uh, we we want you know we want that higher level, and then we want to see how those differences fit together. Thank you, Professor Long. Um, one last question before we close, um, and um, Maharaj has to leave at twelve thirty, so um, we, you know, should wrap up soon. Um, one last question, though, is the young. This is from Nicholas Oskoff. Um, the young people today are overwhelmed with teachings of all sorts, many of which seem glittery but have little substance. How to introduce Swamiji to the youth? What teachings are the first and most likely to penetrate the minds of a young modern person struggling in the world? A good place to end, I think. I, I could, I could, uh, I could say something to that. Uh, just based on my own experience, when I was a student, what attracted me to Vivekananda, besides his great personality, of course was this teaching on strength, which is what I tried to share with you earlier today, that something that makes us strong to deal with the challenges, immediate challenges, and even challenges that are yet to come. Because I think 
only an otherworldly philosophy may not take hold of uh, young minds well, of any of any age, but especially of of the present times. So I think the idea that Vivekananda's teachings can help us deal with the challenges that are present now, but the challenges that are yet to come as well might help in uh, in attracting uh, the younger generation to Vivekananda's thought. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, and on that note, we were supposed to be joined by Reverend Avino um, of the, Parla the 2023 Parliament of World Religions, but I don't see him unless I'm missing him, uh, Reverend Avino. Um, I'm going to assume he's not able to make it today. Um, so on that note, uh, let us conclude. Um, so just would like to say thank you to everybody. I would like to thank first and foremost Swami Tiyaganandu Maharaj uh, for inspiring the seeds of this idea for a program at the Free Library. Um, I'm so grateful, Maharaj, for everything um, from just, yes. <laughs> uh, my, my deep thanks also to Swami Atma Gyanandaji uh, of the Vedanta Society of DC, Dr. Devin Patel, Dr. Jeffrey Long, uh, who are guiding and supporting this program from the beginning with their deep knowledge of the Vedanta and love of Swami Vivekananda. Uh, thank you to all the members of our reading group, my goodness, um, who made the time to join us every Tuesday for eight weeks. Um, Sarah Mitchell of the Education, Philosophy and Religion Department of the Free Library of Philadelphia. Uh, thank you. Um, and then uh, there is an exhibit for those of you who are in Philadelphia. Sarah and I put up this uh, exhibit a few weeks ago. So if, if you're able to make it, please do. Um, and thank you too also to the Vivekananda Study Circle, um, which uh, has you know given me so much and you know inspired this as well. Um, and then um, of course, let my deepest gratitude to the eternal guidance of the Holy Trio, Holy Mother Sharada Devi, Sri Ram Krishna, and Swami Vivekananda. Namaste all. Thank you for coming. We have a brief concluding prayer now. Devenji, would you, would you mind leading it? Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Badrani Pashantu Makashid Dukabhag Bhavet Om Shanti 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 May all be happy May all be free of illness. May all see wonderful things. And may none of us suffer. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Divya, for taking care of us these eight weeks. My privilege. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, hopefully, we'll see each other again. <laughs>